The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. I'm Charlotte. <laughs> so I'm on the stage here with uh, no, one, no one else but Doug Van here. And uh, Doug's going to talk about some things in a second. I'd like to, before we start our keynote off, I'd like to run through a couple of housekeeping items. And uh, anybody has any questions, that's cool. But we'll keep that short because I want to get, uh, get this thing rolling. Um, so I'd like to really thank our sponsors who made this happen. Um, and uh, so these guys, you know, what I'd say is, you know, check out the sponsors, be aware of them, go to the website, DribbleCampCharlotte.com, and uh, make sure to, you know, if you use their products or check them out, make sure to let those guys know that, uh, you know, you heard about them at Drupal Camp Charlotte. Um, we, we like to have these guys back uh, for next year, and uh, so that would be great. And uh, so... Anyway, we've, I did want to mention we've got a couple of sponsor tables right across uh, from the keynote hall, and uh, that's Hot Drupal, and they're a North Carolina Drupal hosting company. They specialize in Drupal hosting, and uh, so if you want to keep some money in the North Carolina state or in the area, that's a great company to check out. And also, thank you. Thank you. Um, and also, uh, Interactive Knowledge, uh, who's a web development group and uh, here in Charlotte. We like our Charlotte companies to be a part of this, and uh, uh, they have uh, got a table over there, and so uh, Eric Veal is uh, kind of rep for that, uh, and uh, so super. So I just want to mention those guys since they have tables, and uh, so, you know, uh, I got an email back, I guess in January, from Doug Van saying, hey, can, you know, would you be interested in helping the, you know, the, the Shardug to help make this camp happen in Charlotte when Self was coming to Charlotte, and the, you know, the first thing I think I said to Doug was something like, well, I need to take this to a meetup and find out. So that's, that's what we did. And uh, we had enough folks that said, yes, let's make this happen. Um, anybody who was involved with the camp organization or kind of in, in any way, can you stand up? Any, anybody give us a stand up? Come on, Brian, everybody. Take. So these folks made it happen. And uh, each and every one of them, they mean a lot to me. I love all those guys. And uh, so, so this is a good time just to mention the Charlotte Drupal user group. Uh, we are still working on our website. It's ironic. Um, and uh, so probably the best place to see what we're doing right now until we get that finished up is our meetup site. So check that out. We'd love to have people come in. We're very, uh, we've got a lot of things going. And whoever shows up, the group is uh, kind of led by the people that show up. It's a group effort. And uh, our, our, of course, DougVan.com, Semantic um, Blue, and, uh, and uh, Synaptic, Synaptic, Synaptic. Um, I changed your company name almost. That's a bad brandy. Um, but we'd like to thank Doug for, this is the third year? Third year. So, so third year, Doug's been leading this thing. He's been in South Carolina a couple years, so uh, that's awesome. Uh, of course, Southeast Linux Fest, because we play off of what those guys do, so uh, we can give them a hand. Or, but I uh, hope you enjoy some of those Linux conference uh, sessions. But really, uh, that's great. They, they make sure that we have kind of a place to come to and, and have these things. So it's a huge deal, and uh, they, they help us along the way. Um, as far as facilities, uh, there's three. We've got a session schedule out at the booth, the registration booth area table, and uh, we do have this room, uh, the hot Drupal room is one of our session rooms. We have, when you walk out of these doors and head to the right, there's a, uh, the classic room, uh, and then if you take a left out of this room and go take another left down the hallway, there is the, uh, um, let's see, which room is that? Dev Cloud. Yeah, that's the Dev Cloud room right, right around the left. So uh, all good meeting rooms, and that's where your sessions will be split up throughout. You can get a tic-tac-toe, too, I think, don't you? That's a tic-tac-toe. Yeah, yeah, so whoever wants to make the next move will go for that. Uh, restrooms are to the right and on the left, so the restrooms are really close. Um, I want to thank uh, Top Floor Studio and Pixlr for providing some mobile applications, so you can check those out and download them uh, on the app stores. 
And um, so those guys helped us out, and community sponsors, we appreciate that. That's a, that's a lot of work um, just to do for the camp, and we appreciate it. And uh, so if you're, if you're into the social media stuff, uh, follow Drupal Camp CLT. There's our hashtags for Flickr, so if you, we'd love photos, so if you take photos, upload them and tag them. And uh, we've got a camp survey, and we'll probably send this out in addition with a, so it, make sure you get that. I'm going to flip by real quick. Make sure you get that tiny URL. Um, but we'll send that out in a follow-up email, but we'd love to get feedback on the camp. Uh, it would really help us uh, for next year. Um, and I want to go ahead and let Doug <coughs> talk about something he wanted to Hello, everybody. My name is Doug Van. This is my Drupal event voice that's kind of shot. Uh, a lot of talking, a couple interviews, and uh, way too much rebel rousing. But um, I want to thank you. Who, who's been here all three years? Two years in Spartanburg, and now our first year in Charlotte. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. We, uh, three years ago, when the uh, Southeast Linux Fest organizers approached me, uh, I was speaking at Ohio Linux Fest. I was giving just a Drupal talk at their regular Linux Fest. And Dave, uh, one of the Daves, there's two of them, approached me and said, hey, you know, why don't you come to uh, Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg and, uh, and put on a camp? I said, you, you want me to come speak? No, we want you to, well, you're welcome to do that too, Doug, but come put on a camp. And I, we went back and forth, and I finally figured out they had the rooms, the AV, you know, everything going on. They wanted me to wrangle up some speakers and put on a camp. So I posted some stuff on groups.drupal.org. People responded. We had a good time in 2010, had a good time in 2011. And uh, they moved to Charlotte. And I want to let you know, we've already got this place booked for a year from right now. We've got the dates all booked. So we're going right back here again in a year. So put, put that on your calendars for sure. And the year after that, we may be moving again because we're kind of, you know, this is a touring, a touring self. So I wanted to make a note of that. Um, also, uh, if you don't have a Drupal.org account, get one. And of course, go get a groups.drupal.org account. Check your geographical area. We have a lot of group organizers in the room, so uh, check your, your geographical areas on groups.drupal.org and join your local groups. Also, I want to point out association.drupal.org. Um, we do have an association, and they're very busy and active. They don't really govern us and control us. They kind of facilitate things and make things work. They make drupal.org work. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a contributing membership um, that you can join for 30 or a whopping 30 bucks a year, and that money goes towards moving Drupal.org to Drupal 7, making improvements on various things. And there's a huge initiative, a very well-funded initiative right now, doing a lot of improvements on Drupal.org as it moves to Drupal 7. Not just moving to Drupal 7, but actually taking advantage of Drupal 7 in the process. So there's also a, a business, business and marketing committee that's, that we recently started. I'm on the task force for that. And we're making a lot of advancements and getting a, a single voice out there and getting a, a dedicated voice of putting forth the truth about Drupal and dispelling the myths. So please, please, as you join Drupal.org and groups.drupal.org, please also consider spending 30 bucks on uh, the association.drupal.org, uh, association.drupal.org, and contributing to that. You can, you can put as much money as you want to in there, but it all costs 30 bucks it's, uh, per, annual, uh, per year. So that is awesome. Thank you for making uh, Southeast Linux Fest number three, the, the Drupal camp here, uh, an awesome gig. And uh, I want to give you Ken. I'm going to turn that off and keep it for you. Check. This microphone on? Everybody can hear me? Yay. All right. So we're going to talk about a brief history of Drupal. It's going to be a lot of fun. Before I get started, I want to thank uh, the organizers, including including everybody at uh, the Charlotte uh, Drupal user group, um, and particularly the folks that I've had communication with, uh, Mark Shropshire, who did not introduce himself when he was up here speaking, uh, Doug Van, uh, Brent Dunn, and um, David Norman. So I'll uh, give you the quick introduction of, of who I am, uh, what I do. Um, Ken Record, I have a, a five-digit user number on Drupal.org, which is actually a, a badge of honor, uh, <laughs> which is great. Um, I do work for a company called Palantir.net. We're out of Chicago. We are distributed. Um, uh, I am Agent Rickard on almost every piece of social media, including Drupal.org. You can find me on, my, on the web. Um, I have been around for a long, long time. Um, I actually have to, li I have to update this list. I've been to 13 Drupalcons. 13? Okay, it's not that impressive. I've been to all three of these. <laughs> right? Um, I helped write a book, this is my shameful plug, uh, Drupal 7 module development, which is sort of manuals on things they won't tell you. It's, it's really five of us at, at Palantir talking about really, really difficult topics. Um, I wrote two chapters, including the only thing that's ever been written coherently about the node access system in Drupal. And it's a shameful plug because every copy that's sold, I get about 88 cents. So, yeah, hey. Um, I do maintain a lot of projects. I'm most famous for the domain access module. Um, 
I have a certified to rock score of seven, which is decent. Um, and I was actually, uh, in terms of patch con contribution, I was number 45 on the Drupal 7 uh, contributors list, which is actually pretty, pretty amazing, considering that my patch contributions to Drupal 7 entirely consisted of uh, spending three years developing in Drupal 6 and filing bug reports against things I ran into. <laughs> right. So we'll talk about that a little bit. This is actually the, the big chart of contributors to Drupal 8. And this is just patch contributors, so it's a little bit misleading. And there's my little, there, there's my name right there. So, so I'm still there, uh, which is pretty exciting for me. Um, I'm going to talk about really three things today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal history with Drupal. I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical history of Drupal with a little bit of a, nud, uh, a, a nod to Linux and the state of the LAMP stack uh, during Drupal's origins, which I think is really kind of fascinating. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 and where it's going. Um, and as a reference point for a lot of things, I'm going to talk about Drupal 3. And the reason I talk about Drupal 3 is simply because it's the earliest version of Drupal that's still available in the Git repository. Uh, and if we really have time in the end, I'll show you a working demo of it because I've got it running on my laptop. Um, I am also going to spend a little bit of time talking about how important the Southeast is to the history of Drupal. And I'm going to do some shout outs to some work we did a long time ago. Um, I am from Augusta, Georgia. I was joking with the folks at the hotel here. They said, oh, you're on a high floor. I was on the 11th floor last night. And, and I said, before they told me it was 11, I was like, well, how high is it? She goes, well, the hotel goes to 18 stories. Well, in Augusta, our highest building, which I used to work in, is 15 stories tall. So I'm really excited to be on the 11th floor. Um, Augusta is the home of James Brown. It's the home of the Augusta National. And as I said to folks last night at dinner, um, unless you like golf, there's really no reason to come visit, I'm sorry to say. Um, <laughs> we, we do, however, have a great triathlon. So if you're into that kind of thing, it's awesome. Um, I used to work for a company called Morris Communications. Uh, when I worked there, uh, Morris is headquartered in Augusta, and when I worked there, this was the map of everything we owned. Um, they're a newspaper, radio company. Here in North Carolina, they owned Fairway Outdoor Advertising, a big billboard company, which I think they've actually sold off since then. And I'll point out that I used to work in a place that was a huge company. We were actually undergoing uh, a transformation onto SAP while I was there, which was really painful. Um, we did everything in Oracle. Um, we had Linux servers for some stuff, but I remember our sysadmins wouldn't let us put PHP on a public-facing web server um, until, well, I forced them to do it in about 2006. Um, but I came out of a big iron, big enterprise kind of thing. We have, um, in one of our buildings, we had basically a $3 million data center. Right. Um, some of the folks that I used to work with um, knew how to program on punch cards, which was kind of fun. And a lot of our folks um, actually used to work at the Savannah River nuclear site. We got a lot of computer engineers who had experience at the nuclear site. And I did a talk about this in Barcelona a long time ago. You talk about the sort of culture clash between, um, you know, I'll get to it in a second, the culture clash between the folks who were doing open source development and the kind of folks who work at a nuclear you know, decontamination and development facility where failure is really not an option. And so I actually grew up in an environment, I was a webmaster first, and then I went into the sort of R&D arm at the national headquarters. Um, and I've been working on the web since 1998. And I worked for a guy named Bob Gilbert, and Bob was a really smart guy. Uh, and Bob was really frustrated, because we had all this big iron, we were doing, you know, really slow things. It turns out at Morris, we had developed our own proprietary C-based scripting language. Stay with me for a second. Proprietary C-based scripting language whose sole purpose was to allow web developers to write queries to Oracle in a safe way and format the output. So what does that sound like to you? Yeah, we, we invented a clone of PHP at the same time as PHP, did not open source it, um, and it caused us all kinds of headaches. Number one, if you needed new functionality, you had to get a C engineer to write it for you um, because the tags didn't exist. Number two, we couldn't really hire anybody to write code for it because it doesn't look good on a resume. We had all kinds of messes. Uh, so Bob is looking at this, and we're trying to build, this is in 2004, 2004, 2005, we're trying to build a CMS in our proprietary scripting language. Yeah. How many people have done that before? Yeah, OK, three. Yay, us. Um, so, so Bob used to work at a company called Great Bridge. Great Bridge um, was a spectacular failure in the early 2000s. Um, it was massive PostgreSQL replication. 
Um, they actually hired so like five of the top Postgres developers, and they were going to do um, essentially you know, cloud-based SQL storage before that was even a thing. Um, it failed spectacularly, but at one point, um, he caught the open source bug because the, his exposure to the Postgres community really changed his mind. And he turned to me one day and he said, look, we're trying to build this CMS in our own framework and it's a disaster, right? It's too slow. I mean, the, the functionality was too slow, but the development was too slow. And he looks at me and he said, I want you to make us faster. And to do that, he gave me a copy of this book. How many people have read this book? This is Eric Raymond's The Cathedral in the Bazaar. All right, everybody in the room gets homework, especially the young students in the room. You need to go get yourself a copy of The Cathedral in the Bazaar. What is The Cathedral in the Bazaar? It's Eric Raymond's history of the development of Linux. It's contrasted with the history of the development of Windows. The very simple thesis of this book is there are two basic methods of software development. There is the cathedral, and in the cathedral model, there is one large central authority that tells everyone else what to do and how to behave, and you must get the cathedral's approval to do anything, Microsoft being the cathedral. In the bazaar, the trader's market, the farmer's market, where you just go and you sort of haggle for what you want, and you get what you need, and you go do your thing, that's the Linux model. All right. Raymond's argument essentially is the bazaar is always going to win. And if you go around this, this conference or see some of the things, work with some of the things that are on this board here, um, you'll know, I think, we'll all agree, that the bazaar, the open source movement has won. And I do long talks about this. But I think this is really important groundwork for how we got into Drupal and why Drupal has been successful. So when I talk about this culture clash, this is Rasmus Lerdorf, the inventor of PHP. This is one of his classic slides. He uses this in almost all of his talks, and I love it. Um, but this was the sort of attitude that Bob wanted to instill in me. And this is why we adopted Drupal in the first place. I'm there, it's late 2004, and I'm looking at CMS frameworks. Um, and there weren't a whole lot out there. But it was f precisely for this reason, so that we could start doing some experimentation. Right? What happens if we try this? What happens if we try that? What happens if we, you know, without having to involve half the company and, excuse me, some very expensive, quite frankly, C engineers. So this is my Southeast shout out. This is Bluffton today, Bluffton, South Carolina. Anybody know where that is? Anybody? Bluffton is most famous for being across the bay from Hilton Head. Bluffton is actually a booming metropolis these days, largely because Hilton Head is full. Um, this is actually one of the few newspaper success stories of the last decade because the folks in Savannah looked around and said, Bluffton is going to explode, let's found a newspaper there. Um, this is the first newspaper website launched on Drupal. This is from 2005. We built this, I think we built the prototype in Drupal 4.5, the actual launch, I think we did launch it in 4.5 and then upgraded it pretty quickly to 4.6. Um, Bluffton today was first, uh, Savannah now was second. Uh, back in 2006, I'm running around DrupalCon Vancouver with a laptop version of this thing. This is in Drupal 4.6. Um, and at the time, everybody at uh, DrupalCon was trying to get Drupal 4.7 out the door. Right? But me, I come from this attitude of, I'm one of the early enterprise adopters in Drupal. And I, I was literally at Vancouver to validate the fact that we had decided to launch a very important property on Drupal and that it wasn't going to kill us. Right? I was there doing research. I was there doing R&D. I had, our, I had our, the guy who headed up all of our um, development. He was in charge of the Oracle systems. He was in charge of the, the proprietary system. He was in charge of the sysadmins. He was in charge of everything. I had him in tow with me to basically see that this was not a crazy idea. He still thought it was a crazy idea. <laughs> but it was hilarious to me because the, everybody I talked to was like, oh, you have to build this in 4.7. You have to do it in 4.7. And my answer at the time was, yeah, but you guys are still in alpha. It's not even going to be in beta for four months. There's no way I can go back to my multi-million dollar corporation and tell them, oh, yeah, we should use this alpha software. That would be great. So yeah, it was a bad decision at the time, it turns out. But anyway, so that's, that's where I come from. Now, sort of parallel to my career, this is funny. This is a classic photo of Dries Boichard. Dries is the Drupal product, project lead. This is actually a hard photo to get a hold of. This is, in fact, someone's uh, picture of a screen <laughs> from a presentation that he did probably in London. Um, this is Dries in college. So in 1998, I'm down in Arkansas. I'm working for Morris. I'm, I'm a newspaper webmaster. I'm building websites by hand. Actually, we were building by hand, and we had a, a custom-rigged FileMaker Pro database that would spit out HTML for us. It was awesome. Um, so at the same time, Dries, 
you know, he's in college, he's working with his friend, uh, and he has some ideas. And it's funny, and you can read this on your own. This is the sort of official history of the Drupal project on Drupal.org. Um, Dries was a Java engineer, if you didn't know that. Dries has a PhD, actually, in computer science, and his, his uh, thesis is on garbage collection in Java. And he and his buddies were all computer, you know, computer science uh, majors, and they were at the University of Ghent, and they wanted to help communicate. Um, they were also, I think, trying to get around some very restrictive Wi-Fi policies at the university, so they were sort of bundling some stuff on, and uh, they just started, they built a, a message board. And the first version of Drupal, actually, um, drop.org, is essentially a clone of Slashdot. That's what they wanted. They built a, a clone of Slashdot. And it was an attempt to experiment, right? This whole Rasmus Leridor fail fast, fail cheap, um, don't repeat yourself thing. So they experimented with all kinds of interesting stuff, including feed aggregation, because RSS was fairly recent at the time. Um, they tried to write a search algorithm. They tried to write a bunch of stuff. Um, and what we're going to sort of talk about in the next bit is what did they get right and what did they get wrong and what legacy of this experimentation still is with us today. Oh, this is, <laughs> this is um, yeah, uh, a working clone of drop.org that one of my coworkers found. Um, to give you the sort of the, the landscape of that, the 1.0 version of Drupal comes out in the, the 15th of January 2001. Um, well, what the heck does that mean? And why is that important for us today? That's, I think, my big question. Um, this is a great list of things that didn't exist when uh, Drupal first came out. Uh, there was no Rickrolling either. Comes a little later. Um, these are com comparable systems. This is uh, the stuff that we would consider Drupal's peers or its competitors in the marketplace. Um, there is no WordPress yet. There is no Joomla. Mambo is just about to be released. Um, I remember actually, um, I started looking at CMSs before the big Mambo Joomla split, um, the schism. Uh, movable type was about to come out. Movable type was pretty big at the time, um, about a year later. Um, Plone isn't out yet. Typo3 is out. Typo3 actually um, is still a big use in Germany, not so much here in the United States. Uh, PHP Nuke comes out at the same time. <laughs> Has anyone ever used PHP Nuke? Really? I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who admitted that. But. And then .NET Nuke, which is the three scariest things I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> hey, let's cobble together a system and then port it to ASP. Okay. Um, so he comes up with drop.org. Uh, drop.org is funny because it's a typo. He was actually trying to register a domain, uh, Dorpia, Dorpia.org. Uh, Dorpia being uh, a Dutch for little village. <laughs> Dutch is a cute language. You can add like ya at the end of anything and make it small. Like, so I, I met a Dutch guy years ago and it's like, yo, you got a Snickers bar. And then there's the Snickers ya. Oh, what, that, the little mini Snickers. So, um, so he, he typoed the domain name and ended up with drop.org because it's like, you know, the year 2000, you could still accidentally get domain names that were cool, right? So drop.org. Um, <laughs> I love this. This is, um, this is the administrative back end of, the, of Drupal 3, actually. Um, um, I wouldn't laugh that much. This is the administrative back end of Drupal 7, right? Um, this is the content administration page of Drupal 3 and the content administration page of Drupal 7. It's just a little shinier. Um, and there's some filter stuff, right? Um, <laughs> and what's this page? Well, the permissions screen, which hasn't changed. Well, it's got headers on it now. I'm not even going to show you. But uh, some of the, one of the interesting things to me about Drupal, uh, its early origins, uh, some of its foundations are actually solid enough that they're still in, in play. Um, some of their foundations are, are kind of crumbling and we need to replace them and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but there are a couple of baseline assumptions in here and the, the first one actually is a slide I took out um, is that the reason we have Drupal to begin with is the sort of fundamental reason of all open source, which is somebody had a problem that they wanted to solve, right? It's that scratch your own itch mentality. It's one of the reasons people are at events like self, right, is so you can learn to solve problems for yourself. Um, I have, uh, I would love to get into Richard Stallman and Xerox and all the history of GNU and all that stuff, but I don't have time. Um, but Dries is coming out of that same background. Hey, I've got a problem, I want to solve it. Okay? Um, some of the other great assumptions, uh, the assumption in the early version of Drupal is that you're not going to have any anonymous site visitors, essentially, that it's all people communicating with one another, that you're expected to interact. Um, 
posts are moderated. There are different data structures for different content types. I think the, out of the box, it shipped with three content types, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, administration was separate. That's important. Uh, the user permission system actually has not changed much at all. Uh, I think it's a big deal. Uh, there were a lot of tools to help you find and edit your content and manage your own content. Um, and there's this, this last one here. Uh, there is this big assumption that users have technical competency. Uh, that has been a problem historically as Drupal has gotten larger, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we have time. So my other point is, well, okay, so why, why do we want to delve into any of this history? Why is it important as a sort of grounding, especially, I mean, how many of you folks, this is your first Drupal event? About a third of you. Well, welcome. Um, what do I want to say about that? This is the, the graph, basically, of the number of people uh, attributed, to commit co uh, attributed to have contributed code to different Drupal versions. And I started Drupal 3, which has like six people listed. There's six core developers. Uh, and on the last one, that slide where I was number 45, yay me, um, we had about 900. For Drupal 8, we're already somewhere over 1,500, I think. Yeah. Um, this slide is actually old. I need to update it at the time I did this slide. This is the sheer number of people just registered on Drupal.org, right, which went from about 10. And if you ever find someone with a, with a a one or two digit Drupal ID, you should buy them a beverage of their choice. See, that's code of conduct right there, Doug. Yeah, there you go. A beverage of their choice. And you should ask them politely what they would, what they would like to drink. Um, I'll tell you why that's funny maybe later, if I dare. Um, but uh, recently, I mean, we passed a quarter million users on Drupal.org. They're uh, right now actually probably close to a million and that's just the people who bother to register. There is sort of a silent legion of Drupal users that are not accounted for. Um, that is very, very fascinating. And, and the, the wider adoption, I mean, just the sharpness of this curve, this is a, essentially an eight-year timeline. The sharpness of this curve is actually pretty interesting and a little bit scary to some of us. Now, I say that because this is a, a photo from Drupal Camp, what's the capital of Belgium? Um, no. Brussels. This is Drupal Camp Brussels in, in 2006. And this is the entire camp. And it's small enough that I can actually look at the photo and pull out specific people. Like this is Angie Byron right here front and center, maintainer of Drupal 7 and most awesome person in the history of everything. Right? Um, this is a picture of DrupalCon Denver where there were 3,500 people. Right? Um, there is a very, very, very huge difference between this community, right, which is about equivalent to the number of people in this room, right? Think about how hard it would be for all of us to agree on something. Make a plan for moving forward, right? Now, multiply that by, you know, a factor of 15. And that's just the people who can come, who can attend. Um, so there are some very interesting f issues facing the Drupal community. Um, the documentation and support, I think, are at the top of that list pretty much always, especially for those of you who are new to Drupal and might be going, oh my God, what am I doing? Right? <laughs> what do I do now? I, I had a, a fascinating conversation with, with someone, um, they were paying me to have, but a fascinating conversation with someone on Thursday, and she asked a very innocent question, well, how do I do this? I said, well, there are two difficult ways to do it, or there's an easy way to do it, right, using this feature that I wrote for Views module. And she didn't even know the feature existed, even though she was using the Views module. It's like, oh, okay. So there's some, some assumptions also. This is the other interesting thing. There's some assumptions that those of us who have been around for a long time, I just had my seventh Drupal anniversary, um, there's some assumptions that we have, including that technical competency assumption, that aren't necessarily true, and this causes problems. Um, so documentation and support, usability, uh, technical debt is a huge problem at this point in Drupal. Um, code patterns, which is basically how are we going to write things, why are we going to write them in certain ways. Uh, performance and scalability, community identity, and this is where all that DrupalCon code of conduct comes in. Um, and this Drupal 8 development cycle. So these are some of the things we're gonna, we're gonna touch on. And I gotta stop and check time, too. So, all right, we're good on time. Um, 
one of the things I do want to say is why is Drupal still here? I actually have a slide that I, I took out uh, that shows there's like six hooks in Drupal 3 that still exist. There's like six functions in, in Drupal 3 that have been, not been changed at all. Um, but the hook model actually worked. The hook model um, gave an, an incredible amount of flexibility uh, to Drupal as a system. And for novice developers like myself at the time, in particular, gave a very easy entree into how to do complex things. Uh, one of the first sessions I ever went to in Drupal was um, Adrian, um, whose last name I can never pronounce. Anyway, uh, one of the first sessions I ever went to was essentially, here are the four hooks you need to do to write a module. It was fascinating. Um, and it sort of walked you through how to do it. Um, so hooks, I mean, syndication, data separation, persistent variables, which was actually a problem when, when Drupal got written, uh, theme overrides, which is what I was talking to someone about the other day, SQL protection, which was all built in, you know, page casting, translations. All of this stuff existed in the early versions of Drupal, right? Uh, which I think is kind of fascinating. Um, and this is my nod to, hey, we're at a Linux fest, so let's talk about LAMP and why that's a big deal. Because I said before, uh, early Drupal comes out in 2001. Yeah, PHP 4 isn't stable until the 23rd of June. Um, Drupal up until 4.5, I believe, still supported PHP 3, um, which makes this for some interesting compromises in terms of the code. Uh, the same thing is true of MySQL. MySQL 4 uh, isn't stable in 2001. Right? We still supported MySQL 3 through Drupal 4.7, I believe. Right? I think we dropped support for MySQL 3 like five years ago, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, Apache, and I don't know anything about Apache, so, but I put these numbers on here in case they're of interest to you. Um, and Linux, these are the Linux uh, versions that are out and stable at the time. And I don't even know what we're on now because I'm not a big Linux guy. And this is one of the, <laughs> I love this slide. This is one of the consequences of that timeline, right? How do you do persistent variable storage? Why does Drupal have this, this variables table, it's all this? Well, the define statement, which is used to define string variables and things, doesn't even freaking exist. And I said freaking, can I say that now? <laughs> say it straight to the camera, freaking. Define, one of these sort of fundamental constructs that we think about, isn't even in the language at the time. Right? And you can see we abuse the heck out of it now. Um, but I, I find that sort of fascinating. And the other thing that people always point to in Drupal, and they're like, why isn't it more object oriented? Why, why, why? Well, you have to point at PHP 3 for the answer to that. All this object inheritance, this is actually a page straight out of the PHP online manual. Um, PHP's object-oriented support really doesn't kick into gear uh, until PHP 5. And a lot of people will tell you doesn't really get complete until PHP 5.4, which isn't even out yet. Uh, it's in testing. Right. Um, so we have some very interesting problems. And I, I like this slide also, because there are a lot of objects and classes in Drupal 7 now, and Drupal 8 is going to go even further in that direction. In fact, there's some fundamental architecture being rewritten in an object-oriented mode. But it surprised me to find out that there were actually 17 classes in Drupal 3. And guess where they are? They're in the theme layer. And they're in the theme layer because Drupal, at the very beginning, these guys were, they were back-end developers. They were, they're Java developers. They're you know, interested in databases and things. They weren't real interested in front-end presentation. And they thought that doing a class would be the easiest way to explain to HTML authors how to influence the look and feel of presentation. And I, I say they weren't really design-oriented because these are the themes that ship with Drupal 3. Yeah, and they awesome? One of them has like a really bragging comment in the header too that's like, this is the totally awesome theme and blah. It's like, yeah, okay. Uh, hey, it was, it was a long time ago. Um, but it's, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, and we got away from this. Actually, it's interesting because user and node are classes, uh, full classes in Drupal 3. Um, but only recently did we commit the patch to Drupal 8 to make all entities um, proper objects. They're now, node is no longer a standard class object. It is now its own class. Hooray! Uh, which is gonna make people's uh, lives a lot easier. These are new concepts since Drupal came out. Right? We've had to adapt to them. jQuery being a huge, huge boon to the community. 
Um, there's a big move going on right now to integrate Drupal with other systems. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, WYSIWYG editors is on this list. I mean, yes, they were desktop WYSIWYGs, but the idea that you should be able to put a WYSIWYG into your uh, web editor um, is, is fairly radical, uh, or was at the time. Simple test comes in, exception handling, right, because PHP didn't support it at the time. Um, open ID, PHP font, all this stuff. Um, totally new to Drupal. So there are some, some foundational, I want to say some sort of foundational assumptions about how Drupal was built that we've had to change and adapt to pretty radically. And we've, as a community, actually done pretty, pretty, pretty well about that. The big one that's coming down, and if you hear anyone um, who's on the Drupal 8 development team uh, talk about it, mobile is the big one that's coming that's scaring everybody. Uh, mobile changes the entire game. Uh, there, are, there are studies out that suggest that you know, within five years, something like 80% of all web traffic is going to be coming out of mobile. Right? And the, the era of the desktop website is just done. Right? What's Drupal built for? It's built for generating desktop websites. Right? Um, so these are some of the things that have come up as, as a response. Uh, these are sort of cool new concepts in Drupal. Um, things that did not exist when it got started um, that I think are fun. Um, my favorite of which, if you've never played with file stream wrappers, they're awesome. Nerd, nerd thing. Um, file stream wrappers, well, I don't have time to get into it, but they're awesome. Um, but again, the foundational concepts have always been there. Uh, this is another one of those things that's fascinating to me. These are the instructions from Drupal 3 about how to install a second language, because Drupal is now and has always been English first, which is very odd when you consider that its originators were in Ghent, in Belgium, and they all spoke Dutch natively. And I asked Dries at one point, I said, w w why is Drupal written in English? <laughs> why is adding Dutch an afterthought? And he said, well, it's a web application and websites are built in English. Now, and, and I make this point when we talk about culture culture issues in Drupal and getting along with other folks and understanding that there are a number of European contributors to Drupal and the Euro European community is thriving and we're you know, uh, building up support in the Asian community and we're having the first Latin American DrupalCon this year. It's going to be down in Brazil in December. Um, and it's interesting to me that we've uh, sort of all had, always had support for multi-language. Um, but I think if Drupal had been invented in the United States, like say WordPress or Plone or anything like that. Uh, well, not Plone, excuse me. Um, WordPress is a good example, though. Um, if an American had invented Drupal, I don't think it would have been multilingual out of the box. Right. Um, and when we talk about innovation, this is my simple innovation slide. Those are the instructions for how to get translations up and running on your old thing was essentially download this file and then run this SQL executable. Um, we have a much more sophisticated way to handle file translation now. Um, which is an example of the type of innovation that's gone on as the community has gotten uh, broader. Um, what I want to say about that, however, is as the community has gotten larger and Drupal has been adapting to the new demands that have been put on it, um, some things have happened. These are the, the number of database tables that get installed with a default Drupal installation. You can see they've more than doubled. This is the fun, the fun slides of numbers. Um, total number of files including JavaScript files and all that good stuff, um, has exploded. That's uh, four times as many files. And if we get views in core, well, that's just going to add some more. Um, code weight, 1.3 megs to 13 megs. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, my, my rough estimate of the number of lines of code in all of Drupal, um, I do put an asterisk on this. That this includes comments and blank lines. Um, yeah almost 300,000 lines of code in Drupal 7. Yeah. Um, and there is a cost to all that. I don't have the infamous, has everyone seen the infamous Drupal learning curve slide? It's a curve that goes like this and then it loops back on itself. There are people, <laughs> there are people falling off the edge of it. I, I don't have this, but this is an older, uh, nicer version of that slide that the increased complexity does add some barriers to, ent to entry. If you are a developer, it can be very, very confusing to figure out where you're going to start. Uh, what can you do and what are you interested in? Um, and this is a, a, a great old slide about um, you know, how competent are you? Uh, but this is developer-centric. Cent uh, 
So some of the things that have gone on in the community that I think are pretty awesome that we should point out um, are big victories. Coding standards, if you look through the, the Drupal 3 code base, there are no coding standards. Um, there are tab spaces all over the place. Some of the f files are in Windows format. Some of them are in uh, Unix format. Um, it's kind of a mess. Um, there's automated testing. There's user experience uh, testing. There's uh, accessibility testing, which is a big new thing for us. Uh, documentation standards. Uh, we have starter themes to help you get up and running faster. We have Drupal cons, which are new. We have Drupal camps that are new. And Drupal camps, in particular, are all about helping onboard people into Drupal, helping get you more involved. And the idea behind getting you more involved is to make you more productive at whatever your, you know, whatever problem you're trying to solve, right? Because the, the great lesson, of course, is that you're probably not trying to solve a problem that a hundred people haven't already tried to solve. Right? There are almost no unique problems in software development. Um, there are probably no unique problems in website deployment and development. And so if you can interact with the community, they can help you out. And I have eight minutes. Um, one last lovely slide about what, well, what are the effects of these kinds of initiatives. Yeah, we have, what is that, 10 times as many functions in Drupal as we used to. Um, however, this is, this is the, the list of number of functions that have been documented. Yeah. In Drupal 3, there is no inline code documentation. None. Uh, no, no doxygen blocks, none of that stuff. Um, this is my great map of, yeah, 98% of all Drupal 7 functions have proper documentation, right? From which we generate, uh, well, this is my example. This is a Drupal 3 request. So it's funny when I say there's what, you know, 300,000 lines of code. Well, this is, you know, like a 12 lines of comment for three lines of functioning code, uh, which just makes maintenance a breeze because, oh, this explains everything that's going on here. Um, and then we can generate great API documentation. So projects like this, initiatives like this, uh, help make us all more successful. So when we talk about Drupal, when we talk about, in particular, you know, where do you fit in the Drupal ecosystem, I said earlier that there is sort of a vast legion of anonymous folks, right? People who don't interact with the community, they don't necessarily contribute back, and they may be perfectly happy, and they may be uh, getting by with their Drupal day to day. Um, but I would point out, you know, and encourage you to look through the type of things that are on, on this list, the type of roles that are on this list, things that are very, very important. Um, and I'm actually going to start at the bottom, because, well, to me, the bottom. I'm going to start the last thing I entered here. Marketers. We actually need marketers right now. We need folks who can help with Drupal marketing. We need folks who can help us stay on message. We need folks who can help us craft the message better and generally present our image better. Um, it's an interesting challenge that no one thought about eight years ago. Right? How do we market things? We need more developers. Oh, Lord, we need more developers. Uh, this is a great time, by the way. Bad, bad job, job market, not in the Drupal space. If you know PHP and you're uh, a nice human being, you can get a job, trust me. Uh, you can ask me later, I'm hiring. Uh, I'm sure a lot of other folks here are too. Um, we need more designers. We in particular, and I've started saying this in the issue queues for the modules that I maintain, I say this a lot to people. Hey, that's a great idea for a new feature. Can you please sketch out how you'd like that to work? Like in the user interface? Because it's an easy technical problem to solve, but how is it going to look? Um, so designer is a big deal. You know, folks who build sites, uh, we want to make sure that the changes we're making to Drupal, we want to make sure that what we're contributing um, is making life easier for people. Um, there are business owners, there are trainers, uh, all this stuff. There are sort of formal roles in the Drupal community. There are core maintainers, there are contrib maintainers. There's a dedicated security team, if you did not know. The dedicated security team does a great job. They do security announcements every Wednesday. They do have a coordinated security release bit. Uh, there is a formal documentation team that always needs help. It's a great way to start uh, contrib contributing to Drupal. The accessibility team needs some help, too. And the user experience team, I know, always needs some help. Um, they are doing some fabulous work, though. So what I would encourage you to do is sort of find what interests you. What do you care about? And you know, if you're a developer day to day, it could just be, if you find that thing that makes you bang your head against the wall because Drupal always makes you write code to work around it, write a patch to fix it. I've written several, several of those. Several of those. Um, there's a big movement right now to simplify uh, and standardize uh, the JavaScript layer in Drupal uh, because our JavaScript is a little bit of a mess. Um, there's a big move to simplify the CSS in Drupal because it's a bit of a mess too because a lot of it was written by folks who that's not really their 
core competency. Um, that is not to denigrate those folks who have worked very hard on that code. It's just to say there are people we know could write it better. And if you're one of them, please, please help us write it better. Um, so I am going to switch at the very end here and talk about Drupal 8. We're all scared of Drupal 8. Um, and I'll make this last, last uh, pitch about the keynote. If I had been truly lazy, uh, Angie Byron Webchick was nice enough to make a Drupal 8 slide deck available. <laughs> so if you wanted to do a keynote or if you wanted to talk about Drupal 8, just like you could fill up an hour with just her slides. And no, I just took a couple. So. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Why are we, how many of you are on Drupal 6, by the way, still? And I sort of am, a little bit. How many of you are on Drupal 7? Okay. How many of you have touched Drupal 8? Okay. Um, Drupal 8 is going to be a fascinating release. And I, I will say this to sort of ease your mind. Uh, the life cycle for Drupal 7 will probably extend at least to 2015, right? The support life cycle. And it might extend beyond that, because enough people are going to be using it as a stable platform for a long time. So I wouldn't worry too much. However, uh, there's some really interesting things going on in the Drupal 8 space. Um, there are five major initiatives going on, and we'll talk about them all very briefly. <laughs> What's funny to me is I, I either work with or used to work with three of those five people. Um, number one is the configura configuration management initiative. Um, and for those of you who are into DevOps or going to uh, Robert Ristoff's talk about Jenkins, this is high on your list of priorities. Um, one of the problems with Drupal's legacy system, of course, is that uh, your configuration variables and your, your content are all sort of mixed together in a very uh, loose way, let's call it. So the configuration management initiative are actually folks actively working on how to make that standardized. Um, and there's some very interesting um, work being done here. I can't even really explain most of it. But it basically is, the, the idea is you want to be able to export configuration to code and push it to, from machine to machine. The features module does a lot of this. I know someone's doing a talk about features this morning. Uh, but they're going to put this into core. And we're going to try very hard, actually, to put um, a content configuration API into core as well. I know that's a, a huge effort. Um, the other huge initiative that's going on is what's called Whiskey, and I can't even remember what Whiskey stands for, but I can tell you what it does. Um, we had said, I said before that Drupal was built for producing desktop websites, but everything's going mobile. Well, the problem is if you look at the way Drupal pages are generated, they are deliberately designed to spit out HTML. Uh, the Whiskey initiative is designed to break that pattern by redoing Drupal's menu and routing system so that requests can be returned in different formats based on uh, the internal, uh, based on the nature of the request, right? The idea is um, publish once, publish everywhere, right? Using internal APIs. And the part about that that's really interesting, if you, how many people have heard of the Symphony stuff that's going on? Okay. Larry Garfield, who's reading the, uh, leading this initiative, Krell on IRC and, and uh, on Drupal.org, um, was at Symphony Live this week, making nice with the Symphony folks over in Paris, uh, because the foundation for what he wants to do, and this is a huge leap for Drupal, the foundation for this type of, of bit is proper HTTP request handling, which is a problem that has already been solved by the Symphony team. Right. There are elements of what we call the kernel patch that have already landed. There are elements of Symfony that are going into Drupal core, uh, which is really, really fascinating. Because um, we're starting to cross-pollinate with, with Symfony, which is uh, essentially um, a standardized uh, PHP library, PHP component library, the way we standardize on jQuery. So uh, this is a giant leap for us. It's actually a very healthy sign in the Drupal community. Uh, and in fact, I can say that the overall plan, the Symphony folks were planning to build their own content management system on top of Symphony, and they're trying to abandon that plan and just use Drupal instead. Yeah. Um, and we're almost to the end. 
blocks and layouts, um, the concept if you've used the panels module, this is another huge initiative that's going on. Chris Vanderwater is leading this one. Um, the idea of making it so that everything is, uh, every little component of the page you can push around and put where you need to and, and output exactly as you want. It's a fascinating initiative. The biggest problem with this one actually is going to be the user experience. It's going to be um, the UI design. It's gonna be the, the single toughest problem to solve. Because if you've ever used panels, it's lovely and awesome and awful to use. Um, so, um, language handling, uh, uh, Gabor uh, Hatsi is uh, improving the way language works. He's trying to make it much easier, uh, much, uh, much clearer to the developers and much easier to, to configure and use for end users. Um, if you care about such things, I just got off the phone with someone who basically makes their living building multilingual websites in English and Spanish for the United States government. <laughs> So they care deeply about this. If that's the kind of thing, this is a great place to dive in. Um, and then there's this responsive design mobile first initiative that's going on, which is going to change the way Drupal's output layer is rendered. Um, how many of you are familiar with responsive design? Responsive design is the hot thing these days, which essentially means instead of having to build a separate app for things so they work nicely on mobile or having to do a separate mobile design and do all kinds of you know, browser sniffing and things, you want to make your design flexible so that it re-renders based on um, the size and capacity of the device that the visitor is on. Um, it's fascinating, uh, John Albin, who works with us at Palantir, is leading this initiative and has written some really good work, uh, stuff on, on how it works. Um, and there are a couple of other interesting things that go along with that, which includes um, full support for HTML5, which gets a lot of people really, really excited, um, including the new HTML, HTML5 form elements, which are sort of necessary to make mobile optimization work properly. Um, and then there's another one, and this is really fascinating. How many of you people dig around in Drupal's theme layer? How many of you don't like Drupal's theme layer? <laughs> yeah, it's about, yeah, about half the folks don't. So there is an, a movement afoot to try to adopt Twig. Twig is actually the template rendering system that um, Symfony uses. It's a, it's a sister project. Uh, it's, a, it's a tangential project to Symfony. And so there is a movement to try to bring across um, what is considered to be by many simpler token-based syntax uh, so that template developers don't have to learn PHP. Um, whether or not this is going to make it into Drupal 8 is an interesting question. Uh, but there's a lot of work being done on it. And there are some folks who are very, very excited about it. People who you wouldn't think might be excited about it. Um, Twig is great for a couple of reasons. The most notably for developers is security uh, because of how it works. Um, it's also really, really fast because it's compiled. Um, that's one of the problems people have to solve, actually, is you take a Twig com template and it actually gets compiled into a PHP executable on the web server so it can then be put in opcode cache and all that. Um, but it's not clear how we're gonna accomplish that in Drupal. So there's another big initiative that Acquia has started about in-place editing and other improvements to the user experience to make content editing easier. Um, and I would say, this is the big note slide you should take. There are lots of places to get involved in core development. Um, there is a team that is dedicated to doing mentoring for new developers, onboarding, um, and you can come in, it's Tuesdays and Wednesdays in Pound Drupal on IRC. Um, there are core wind sprints on Fridays, which is where folks who are deeply involved in core development, including the initiative leaders, can walk you through different issues. They can say, if you come in and say, hey, I really wanna help on the language initiative, uh, Gabor or someone working closely with him will say, hey, well, we need you to test this thing and tell us if it works for you or not or we need you to document how this works. Right? Um, so I encourage you all to drop by. I encourage you uh, to get involved um, because it is, of course, time to start to, can I say this anymore? I think we can say kick ass. We can say kick ass. Um, and the other thing that I'll, I'll point out, and this is the thing that most people like about Drupal, uh, it is a duocracy. It is things get done because people take the time to do them. Uh, which basically means anyone in this room can be a major contributor, right? Anybody in this room can take my job and be up here doing this keynote, right? Uh, and I'll give you a, like an example to, to leave with. Uh, I would say a lot of people talk about rock stars and ninjas, um, and I'm going to argue that there are no rock stars. This is a slide from uh, DrupalCon Vancouver in 2006, and someone in this picture is about to demo Views 1.0. It's that guy. 
right? This is a blurry picture, I know, but I had no idea who he was at the time. This is Merlin of Chaos, um, wandering around the venue floor because he doesn't know anybody because no one has ever heard of him. And then he goes on to demo the single most important module in the history of Drupal 10 minutes later, right? There were like 20 of us in the room and about 10 minutes in, everybody's jaw hit the floor and we, when we figured out what he was trying to do. Um, so that was pretty awesome. Um, and I will say that, I mean, for myself, this is in Vancouver, the first thing I ever contributed to Drupal was a card sort. Uh, card sort is a simple, yeah, somebody knows what those are, they're awesome, right? It's a simple exercise designed to help people group things into like-minded stuff. I showed you the administrative uh, interface of Drupal 3 before. Up until Drupal 4.7, all the administrative links were in one big long page, and it was in Drupal 4.7 that we grouped them into things, and that's the card sort that I did. And it was a card sort, it was me, Merlin of Chaos, Drees, and Nedjo Rogers, and Nedjo has a user ID of like seven, right? And I didn't know anybody. And uh, back up until, they changed it in Drupal 7, but in Drupal 4, 7, 5, and 6, if you ever use the user menu in the admin interface, that's my fault, because I argued for that. I said, no, 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 this is a whole cluster of tasks that are based on who your users are. No code involved here. So, again, there are tasks out there for everyone at all skill levels, at all interest levels, I would say, that are very, very important. Um, and I encourage you very heartily to dive into that. This is how things get done. Um, the, probably the, uh, and this is a, sort of the last thing I've got, uh, this is Dries Boychart, obviously the, the, the project lead. This is um, Chicks, um, Karoy, uh, Nijeshi, whose name I cannot pronounce, one of the most prolific contributors to, to Drupal. This is uh, Robert Douglas, one of the most prolific evangelizers of Drupal. Um, my Drupal life changed because I had breakfast with Robert one morning. And I was complaining about something. I was saying, well, why does this thing work this way and not this other way? And he goes, well, you can fix that, you know, essentially. <laughs> that, that breakfast discussion turned into a Google Summer of Code project, um, which turned into the feeds module. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, here's how much credit I can take for the feeds module. How come the aggregator module doesn't have extensible hooks. That's where feeds module came from, right? So asking those kind of questions I think is huge and I want to encourage you to do it. And I'll be available um, up until I have to go catch a plane this afternoon um, if you have questions like that. So I want to thank you for your time and your patience. I do know we're a little bit over. Yeah, we're a little bit over so we don't have time for questions but I'll, I'll be out in the hallway. Um, and if you need to contact me, this is all my information. Thank you again. And I really do appreciate it. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. 
And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the CloudStack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. 
will continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.